This episode is brought to you by Bowtech. Range testing shotguns is part science and part art. Now, you can objectively evaluate a shotgun's fit and finish, its point of impact, and its key specifications. But because shotgunning is so much about feel, you've also got to subjectively evaluate how the gun carries, mounts, points, and swings to targets. And to do this, you've got to shoot the gun a lot. I'm Editor-in-Chief Alex Robinson, and we just finished testing this year's new field of hunting shotguns, plus the full field of tactical shotguns. And to do so, we shot cases and cases of ammo at Brownell's Big Spring Sporting Complex outside of Grinnell, Iowa. So as you listen to this episode, know that my colleagues, shooting editor Jon Snow and executive editor Natalie Krebs, have sore shoulders, they are sunburned, and they are very tired. But the trade-off is that they have an insight into the world of tactical and hunting shotguns that is worth listening to. I think maybe the best place to start is, Natalie, how would you describe the room that we're sitting in right now? It is a, a pre-1900s old ladies parlor. That is probably haunted. Grinnell, Iowa. In Grinnell, Iowa. Yeah, it's a little old lady's room. Yeah. It's... <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, that's about right. And there are also seven tactical shotguns leaning against an old high back chair in the corner. Yeah, that's a perfect description of what's going on. Uh, <laughs> this is the last night of the shotgun test. And I think we're all a little shell-shocked from all the shooting that we've been doing. You know, we've tested two categories of shotguns this year um sporting field guns and tactical shotguns i think let's start with the you know hunting guns we'll just call them let's start there john maybe just give us an overview of what this field is like and um how we went about evaluating it sure so you know we gathered actually thanks to you a uh, a fairly broad field of of shotguns that even though the absolute numbers weren't great we had whatever it was eight or nine of these hunting sporting shotguns it covered a pretty broad swath of you know kind of end users and purposes and audiences we had everything from kind of super high end bougie ultralight upland guns to general purpose bird guns and duck guns and even like a over under design for waterfowl specifically waterfowl hunting and some budget guns as well so including a budget side by side that uh that that certainly kind of caught our attention as well so we have a a field that you know kind of covers a interesting and surprising amount of ground now you know one of the things that we're used to with our gun tests is Evaluating these things head to head, you know, the cream rises to the top and other stuff sort of settles into the middle. And every now and then you have things that just sort of really don't kind of live up to, to our expectations, which are granted they're, they're pretty high. You know, our, our purpose with all of these tests is to be fair, but thorough and to come away from it with an assessment really geared toward our audience, our readers, our listeners, in terms of how they might want to spend their hard-earned money, you know, and and I think we all have that sort of fixed, it's kind of our our North Star with with all of our gear tests, certainly with the gun tests that we've been doing for decades, is, you know, can we look a friend, a reader, or whoever in the eye and tell them, you know, yay or nay on the, the, the value of a shotgun or any gun to them, you know, and one of the things that sort of happened that was interesting this year is that we've got some good guns in there, but nothing that really blew our doors off. Yeah, no, that's true. Usually there's one gun that by like day two, everyone's kind of fighting over to shoot it more. That wasn't really the case this year, but before we get into like the specific guns, because there are some standouts and I want to talk about um, some of the specific shotguns in the hunting side. But before we get to that, just 
a quick run us run the listeners through how we evaluated the the field. Like, what's the shooting protocol here? Right. So, you know, we have a we have a couple couple goals in mind. One is, you know, putting these guns through an intense barrage of of shooting to to really kind of you know stress them out a little bit and you know it's you can't just run a couple boxes through a gun and feel like you've done done it justice in terms of really getting a feel for how it operates and you know kind of how reliable it's going to be is really the big one so we we purposely are are pretty mean to these guns we get them heated up we shoot them hard we shoot them fast we shoot them all day and we do that by using them on uh we like dynamic targets so we often shoot a lot of skeet which is what we did here in in iowa at the big spring shooting complex which is actually owned by brownells who hosted us here they did a really nice did a solid for us and let us use their wonderful facility and then but we also had and the really the fun thing was the crazy quail so crazy quail if you're not familiar with it is um basically a, a a machine that rotates like a, a automated anti-aircraft gun on a warship and it's just stuffed full of hundreds of birds and it will throw them at any speed in any angle and will get more birds more targets up in the air than you can possibly manage to take on but it doesn't stop us from flinging a bird shot with abandon and trying to knock these down so anyway between the skeet and the crazy quail and um, you know, we're putting a lot of rounds through them, but we're also not just kind of focusing on the targets. What we focus on is a lot on specific elements of how the guns handle. So, you know, in, in a competitive standpoint situation, you might start with a gun pre-mounted on the shoulder, for example, or, or other kind of things to kind of not game it, but that's how, you know, those target sports are done. You know, in our cases, we like to start them from a low ready safety on, you know, have a couple shells either in, in our, bag on our hip or on the shelf in front of us so that you know we after we run the gun dry we can see how quickly we can get it back into action and you know by repeating this process a lot you get a feel for the ergonomics is a big thing you know how our how our hands interact with the gun in terms of the safety the bolt release the carrier release and the other knobs you know the handling in terms of swing characteristics and basically point ability shootability We'll get a feel for the workmanship, obviously aesthetics. You know, we end up judging these these guns on, you know, reliability, on their value, on about seven, seven or eight different categories that we score them on. And so, you know, we the, the only way to do that is to put a lot of shells through them, but to also be deliberate and thoughtful about assessing those specific um, qualities we're trying to get a feel for in turn. So it's it's not just... It, it, from the outside, it maybe it looks like we're just shooting a lot of targets, but you know, so, sort of as we're taking notes and, and thinking about it, there's a lot more going on. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we're here to evaluate the shotguns and not the shooters. So we're not trying to like shoot a perfect score and skeet. You know, we might run a crossing shot five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times in a row to just see can we get this gun. You know, is this is this Head to head, is this easier to shoot this crossing shot with gun A versus gun B? So yeah, it's um, it's a very fun way to evaluate shotguns, especially for me, because I just I'm just always imagining like using these each different gun in a different hunting scenario. You know, one thing we did was like run a bunch of duck loads through the duck guns to see like how they manage recoil. So there's all these little like side quests uh, along along the way too that are actually really realistic. Um, I think that's the one thing that has been fun about our shotgun test over the years is we just kind of evolve it to be like, oh, you know what? You d- we should just run all the you know the two duck guns head to head. We'll just shoot a bunch of you know magnum duck loads through them as fast as we can, and we'll see which one hurts less. Um, <laughs> that's cool. You know, that's like not a lot of, uh, not a lot of listeners or not a lot of even other outdoor writers are like doing that kind of stuff. So that part was fun to me. Natalie, you know, you shoot probably as many or more birds as anybody on staff, you know, sort of as our resident kind of upland expert, you know, how, how does, how does this, how does the gun testing, uh, sort of protocol 
match up against your your kind of like your your experience hunting yeah it's it's funny like the the skeet part is much more gentlemanly is not the right word but you know we're like getting used to the sporting guns the first day we're just like kind of figuring out the sporting the hunting guns like how they shoot you know what's new what's different about them and just like getting a feel for them and that's very low pace like we're not throwing a ton of targets and that feels just like trying to shoot a couple clays before the season like knock the dust off and then crazy quail was what it's like when you're hunting and you know, nothing happens. And then all of a sudden a bunch of birds get up and you're like fumbling for your safety and you're trying to figure stuff out. So to me, that was the most illuminating part was just like, how hectic can we make this to really put the gun through its paces and what I might encounter on some random pheasant hunt with my dog. Um, And so that was really fun. It was like stuff that I thought I maybe liked or was, wasn't an issue when we were shooting skeet became very apparent in crazy quail. Um, And that was really useful. It's just like I want a shotgun where I don't have to think about anything. I don't have to like the safety's there. Everything's there. And it's just very natural. Um, and so it was fun to see what worked and what I stumbled on across the guns. Um, and then also patterning. You know, we patterned the guns and that was really helpful to see which, which is really important for bird hunting and not as many people do it. And that was really useful to see. Well, like there was one gun we had a, a side by side that I couldn't hit anything with. Um, I really struggled with it. And you did too, John. And then we patterned it and we saw that it was maybe shooting a little bit left and not maybe like it was. Whereas other people were able to hit just fine with it. Like Alex, you did. You shot, you shot it well, Matt shot it well. But that was just illuminating to see why, why maybe that was an issue. Yeah. So I don't know. Just every, every example kind of gave us something different. And like Alex was talking about with the duck guns. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can definitely blame the fact that you were missing on that gun patterning to the left. John, John blamed it. I can. Yeah, sure. Go for it. 50, 50. Yeah, that's totally fine. Let's talk about some of the standouts in this field. And we're not going to talk about every gun, but John, what, which shotgun from the hunting sporting category is most interesting to you this year Hmm. most interesting god well interesting is a loaded word the the one the one i liked the best and was most drawn to was the uh benelli montefeltro ultralight now this is it's kind of in a sense it's not an interesting gun because benelli has their pattern that they follow very successful pattern with the guns that kind of have a sameness to them each year. But, you know, Benelli has done such a good job turning out guns that, that are reliable, that are soft shooting, that point well, that are attractive, you know, and, and, you know, you, you kind of look at the price. They're obviously a a slightly more premium price product, but, you know, you get a lot to go with it. Now, the thing I was curious about this gun and, and, you know, this is uh, not just my, feeling on it but you know this is an ultralight upland gun fancy upland gun so far so good but it comes with only a 24 inch barrel yeah you know and so you think about an end user for that you know somebody who hunts really thick grouse cover you know tamaracks up in up in uh the upper midwest and stuff where you're in these like brambles and things like that and you can barely swing a gun anyway you know that would be you know maybe kind of an ideal use for it but that's a pretty narrow niche, yeah. You know, and to a to a person on the test, you know, we we're all just kind of wishing for a couple extra inches or more, yeah, of barrel length on that gun to give it broader appeal. So I know you had some strong feelings on yeah. it. Well, you know, twenty gauge. It's a twenty gauge. Weighs five point six pounds. So the like, and I like Benelli shotguns in general. I you know, own a couple of them. I hunt with them a lot. I typically shoot them pretty well. So I saw this little shotgun. I'm like, Ooh, it looks beautiful. And you know, I'm just, uh, like I was saying before, I'm just imagining carrying this little gun for like pheasant hunting, but then shooting it a bunch. And like you said, that 24 inch barrel, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I might actually rather just take a couple extra, you know, a few more ounces and shoot a 20 gauge with a longer barrel like yeah it's cool to carry a light gun but if you can't hit pheasants with it then you just end up walking much farther and for more hours so yeah i really um you know i kind of liked everything about it except for it was 
a little whippy, you know, shooting it, especially on crossing shots, which, yeah, if you're like snap shooting in the brush and, you know, that's what you're doing for grouse, cool. But otherwise, yeah, it leaves a, a little bit to be desired. Natalie, how about you? What was, what was your most interesting shotgun out of the hunting side? I think I was most interested in the Weatherby Sorex or waterfowl gun, which I don't know. It just like I don't I don't think about duck hunting and Weatherby. And it was just like it was one of the more unique looking. Uh, everybody had kind of different opinions on the aesthetics of it. It's kind of hand painted with sponge to look like brush strokes, like vintage camo, but brush strokes, vintage camo. Um, it's a little like Cerakoted. It's a little yellow, but it had um. You know, it had a slit in the left side of the receiver so that you could put the charging hand on the left side if you want to shoot, you know, left-handed, kind of, which was interesting. I have not seen that before. And it turned out that it handled really well for me. Uh, I'm a right-handed shooter, but it was just, it was everything that the Montefeltro wasn't, which I also wasn't interested in, but it was whippy for me. Like, Weatherby swung well. It's a 12-gauge. It weighs about seven pounds. Like, I just shot it well. But everything else was just a little bit off for me. So it was very interesting and it was fun to shoot, but it's not a duck gun that I think I will necessarily be purchasing or recommending. So Yeah. Made in Italy, which is interesting. Price point around fifteen hundred dollars, which is like, you know, pretty solid for a waterfowl inertia driven semi auto waterfowl gun. But yeah, had a couple odd hitches about it. The one thing about that cut or that slit in the left side of the receiver, which everybody commented on is like, yeah, that's cool. But for all the right-handed shooters, which is the mass vast majority of us, that's useless, but it's a really good way for mud and cattail reeds and water and everything else to get into your shotgun. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that is not ideal for a serious duck hunter. So Yeah. Yeah, and as a general purpose gun, it has some appeal, but, you know, we did have some feeding issues with it. True. You know, and, you know, sometimes that can be like, oh, is it just like target loads or not? But in that case, we actually had, you know, duck loads and, and other, you know, sort of higher powered um, hunting rounds that also had hiccups. It wasn't a ton of them, but it was enough that it, you know, we noted it. Yeah. You know, so that was a, a another kind of just like little kind of ding against it that but otherwise an interesting gun yeah i agree one we should mention quickly browning's a5 in 20 gauge Mm -hmm. you know they've had the a5 this is not the old auto 5 this is the somewhat newer a5 which is a inertia gun that other than i guess kind of the lines of the receiver it's totally different action than um you know the old a5 but you know that gun's been out for a while the A5 uh, in 12 gauge and 16 gauge. And now new for this year, they finally have it in 20 gauge. Another super light gun. Another one we really kind of had high hopes for in the beginning. But yeah, John, maybe talk quickly about the pros and cons of the A5, what we noticed about it. Yeah, well, it's actually an interesting counterpoint to the to the Montefeltro with its 24 inch barrel because it has a 26 inch barrel and longer and and that swing that different swing characteristic and this is to the a5's credit was quite good one of the drills that i put it through was i was on station two on the skeet field and throwing the high house which is going away from station two i was purposely waiting quite a while to you know go after the target so it's basically like a, a distant bird fleeing you know and you've got to move the gun and everything else and whereas that 24 inch barrel on that Montefeltro just I struggled with it it just was not doing a good job hitting those long targets the A5 I couldn't miss with you know I I just felt like you know it was just cycling quickly and just smacking those those birds so you could really feel there was a really good comparison in terms of the handling qualities you know so that was a real kind of to you know to the A5's credit um Speed load feature? Yeah, and the speed load feature. So, you know, I come at this, you know, we're trying to find these points of differentiation. And, you know, I've done a a fair bit of multi-gun competition um, in in, in the past where you've got to be able to load shotguns quickly on the clock and on the move and engage, you know, sort of complex target arrays. You know, that isn't, you know, sort of a typical thing that bird hunters think about. But to Natalie's point before about the crazy quail, like, 
when 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 the action happens it can happen really quick and i think we've all been in a situation where you know you come up on a big covey and you get one bust out of it and a bunch of birds come out and you might empty your gun and there's a decent chance there's a whole other pile of birds sitting right there so getting extra shells into that gun and getting ready for that second round that is not an uncommon scenario and so you know the ability to reload a gun quickly is one I put a lot of value on, and I think it's an important one for for bird hunters. And the Browning A5 has this really cool feature where when the bolt is in the lock back position, you know, the gun's empty, we're familiar with that. You know, typically what you do is you throw a, a round in the chamber and hit the bolt release and then stuff the magazine from the bottom, right? We, we all know that drill, and that'll work on the Browning. Um, but it has this feature where you all you have to do is, with the bolt lock back, stuff one in the magazine, like you're filling the magazine and it will automatically take that first shell that you stuff in, um, eject it onto the carrier and load it like in a flash. So basically you only have one motion to load the gun. So you could put one in there and then grab two. And now you've got three in that gun in a flash and you can get it back up. And in terms of speed of, of rate of fire and loading, nothing could touch that Browning a five. So that's, you know, so it's nice swinging and quick reloading. I mean, that's a, that's a, two really good things on the plus column on the minus column you know it's an expensive gun and about two grand about two grand and it's fit and finish is just a little hit or miss um you know aesthetically it's it's a little odd looking you know the checkering on the fore end isn't is is kind of you know sort of a little clunky looking i think is how we we felt about it and then you look at some of the kind of the finer details on some of the controls and there are a couple funny gaps where the wood meets the metal. I mean, things that just don't feel particularly polished. And, you know, at that kind of price point, you know, you, we, we just have higher expectations and, and the Browning, you know, just didn't quite meet them. Yeah. No, that's, that's totally fair. But the Browning A5 with the speed loading and your like you know, shotgunning experience in history. This is my segue into the more exciting category of shotguns this year, ah. which is tactical shotguns. <laughs> this is something that I had hardly any experience with. But, you know, we know from, you know, doing SEO research and monitoring traffic and you just like kind of being in this world of, you know, defensive guns and personal protection and stuff like that. This is an immensely popular category that lots of people have really strong opinions about. And much of it is very foreign to me. But, you know, I kind of went about and compiled the list of what seemed to be a combination of new and the most popular tactical or defensive shotguns. Um, and as I started getting these guns in, uh, you know, I was just kind of setting them up, putting red dot sights on them, you know, just kind of dry firing them in my basement. It's like, oh, this is going to be really fun. And, you know, we get out on the range. And, of course, it is. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's, like, the most fun. Um, you know, mag magazine capacity alone uh, makes the shooting a lot more fun. More time shooting, less time reloading. So before I keep uh, rambling about how I'm, like, a new tactical shotgun guy, you know, <laughs> going to have to, like, get some tattoos and grow a beard or whatever, I'm on board. John, maybe just uh, walk us through what your kind of definition and expectation is for a tactical slash defensive shotgun. Sure, sure. Okay, yeah, great question. And actually, I'll, I'll take it back one kind of one layer further, you know, because I think this is sort of interesting, you know, um, on, the, on the sporting hunting side, you know, you've got um, such a wide variety of guns. You've got some general purpose guns like the Weatherby. And then, you know, we've got some sporting specific guns. Like we've tested this Italian gun Breda, you know, which is a sporting clays gun. And then, the, then these other inexpensive guns, you know, so all these kind of per, like very different kind of segments of guns, but they all have one thing in common on that sporting side and that hunting side, which is to hit a target on the wing, whether it's uh, actual um you know, animal on the wing, a bird on the wing, a duck or a pheasant or a partridge or, or a target simulating that a clay being thrown. Right. The defensive tactical side is, is very different 
in that the targets are, you know, not as dynamic. It's more static, a lot of static shooting and the moving targets don't move that much. And and again, you start to think about how you might use a, a gun in a defensive scenario. You might have a target on the move, but it's not flying at 40 miles an hour, right? It's also probably pretty close. It's also probably pretty close. Exactly. So a very different kind of set of expectations. But now all of a sudden, you know, the, the, the stakes are higher, right? With a defensive gun, you know, we're talking about literally potentially life or death and things like that. So reliability just moves right to the top yeah. of the list. Um, speed of getting the gun into play smoothly. Yeah. You know, there's no, there's no room for error, no margin for error in there, you know, and, and if you have an issue, you know, getting that gun from whatever your ready position is to fire, if, if there's a problem there, that's a, that's a real concern. Handiness, you know, there's a decent chance you're going to be indoors, you know, very different situation than shooting out of a blind or, or walking the uplands. You know, you want to have, bring adequate um, firepower to the fight. And so magazine capacity, which you touched on, also critical. The ability to add accessories to the gun, you know, lights in particular, red dots for sighting systems, you know, having that kind of versatility is is also huge. So you start to add all of these factors up and and you'll see that the guns, you know, there are a lot of them there, but they, but they all have a common purpose. And then there's also the issue of munitions, right? You know, buckshot and slugs are the two main defensive rounds. But in terms of practice, you know, light target loads, often the cheapest light target loads are what guys are going to run. People are shooters are going to run. And so, you know, a gun, like some guns are kind of quote unquote tuned for those, you know, for the buckshot or the or the slugs or whatever but if it can't run light target loads well too that's that's a drawback as well since you know the guns are fun to shoot i mean we're talking about the serious side but they're super fun you know but they're fun only really with the light target loads right so you know we, we ask a lot of these guns and and they there are a lot of different kind of price points in these guns and a lot of way to sort of skin the cap but they all sort of behave and look and feel in a much more similar fashion than the field of sporting guns. So that's that, that's the compare and contrast and sort of the expectation set. We'll be right back after the break. Having confidence in your gear is an absolute must in any season. And if you're a deer hunter, you know that some of the best opportunities come during bow season. Botex sets the gold standard in anywhere, anytime, tunability, and accuracy. Head over to BowTechArchery.com to see the full lineup. Okay, now walk us through how we went about testing this field of shotguns. Like, what's our protocol? What do we do? Right. Well, I mentioned that we ran the hunting guns hard and fast and furious. Well, do that times five or six on the defensive guns. And that's what we did. I mean, we just got these, these I don't think I've ever shot a case of ammo as fast in my life. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean, we got, we got these guns smoking hot. Yes. I mean, just literally burn your hand hot, burn your you hand. Like, like let's, let's brand some cattle hot, Yeah, you know? And so, you know, we spent a fair amount of time just putting as, many different types of light target loads through them as we possibly could. And we had about four or five different variants of, of um, different light target loads, including some that are, were challenging to shoot like some really fancy paper shells, <laughs> paper hole shells from federal. Thank I, you federal. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thanks mean, for the support. Yep. Thank you federal for the support. There was some British aristocrat who, who fainted <laughs> every time we pulled the trigger because but boy, did they hit steel, <laughs> but boy, did they, boy, did they hit steel. But, you know, as we got these guns hotter and hotter and dirtier and dirtier, I mean, we didn't, you know, if, if something started to really gum up and we had a couple of issues that we would dump some oil or spray some oil in it, but we were not babying these guns at all. You know, so we kind of started with that as the baptism and then, and then we moved on to some more specific um, kind of drills and, and other use where we um, took a number of different types of slugs 
and shot them for group size at 25 yards off of a supported tripod. So a tripod with a basically a little tack table and a shooting bag on it. Um, you know, so, and, and that's because we're, we're not trying to assess our abilities as shooters to sort of hold steady at 25 yards. We wanted to really um, t- take that error out of that human error, an element out of the equation and shoot 10 shot groups to, to see how they, they worked at that distance. And then we did with the buckshot, we ran um, a number of different types of buckshot through the guns and we would pattern a given load at seven yards, 15 yards and 25 yards with five shots total one at seven yards. Cause you don't, you don't really need to, go crazy with a bunch you know everything is super tight at seven yeah i mean the pattern at seven yards if you want to call it a pattern is really just a fist size hole in the or target. smaller yeah yeah or small or sm- yeah exactly i mean it is just a dense concentrated mass of pellets all all within you know just an inch or two of each other 15 yards two shots and then 25 yards two shots and you know, what we typically saw was, you know, m- most of the defensive loads are really good at 15 yards. You know, you're, you're getting, you know, kind of maybe a fist and a half size thing. We're using IPSIP targets. So if you're, you know, if you do that kind of shooting, you know, you know, the vast majority are, are alphas, um, couple, couple, ch- couple Charlies and every now and then at 15, a Delta, not many. Okay. For folks who don't know what you're talking about, explain what that means. Okay, so the the um, the scoring zones on those IPSC targets are divided into A, B, C, and D, and um, you know, and, and sort of the main torso is the A, C, and D area. The B is kind of up in the head. We're not going to worry about that. So, and and you know, when you're shooting away, you you know, with a pistol or something, you really want those alpha alpha hits. Um, and Charlies are good too, and and Deltas, the Ds that are on sort of the rim, the outside of the torso, are are you know, can count as hits, but be penalized or, or whatever. They're not as, they're not, they don't score as, as well, um, roughly speaking. Um, so in terms of the buckshot, you know, the buckshot usually has eight pellets or nine pellets. Um, We're shooting double up buck, double up buck, defensive buck, or some hunting loads as well, you know, and, and that's kind of interesting too, because sometimes I think people think they're sort of interchangeable, but they're really not. And, and certainly as our testing showed and it's shown in the past, you know, you really, you know, the, 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 the quality of the pattern is really ammo dependent, you know, and you can tweak that also in terms of how a gun maybe is choked. Although a lot of these defensive guns come with fixed strokes. So, but the point being is that at 15 yards, you know, typically these things are throwing really tight patterns at 25 yards. Some of them are still functional, good tight patterns, but some of them have really opened up. Right. And, you know, this is, you know, t- you know, using the logic of the platform, you know, you're responsible for every pellet that's going down range. And so, you know, seeing how a gun behaves at 25 yards gives you a really good sense of what the limits are yeah. and, and, and maybe what kind of ammo you should or shouldn't use or what kind of shooting you should or shouldn't do. You know, it's a little nerdy. It's a little technical. And we have a whole way of kind of scoring the proportion of, of pellets that are in that more vital zone, you know, but we, the, the point is, is that we're running these hard with the target loads. We are assessing them for accuracy with slugs at 25 yards. And then we're also doing uh, a lot of shooting with them at buckshot at the different distances, seven, 15 and 25 yards. So we're really kind of covering the gamut. Yeah. Before we get into the standout shotgun in this category, because unlike the hunting guns, there is like a star. Natalie, uh, I think you, like me, were totally new to this field. And also, you know, I've hunted with you a bunch in the past. Uh, You're a very, um, very calculated shooter in all, which is a really good thing. Um, Very calculated shooter in all scenarios. Most of the time I've seen you shoot, you shoot once or twice, but that changed today when you started shooting some of these, uh, some of these tactical guns. I mean, obviously you're still super safe, you know, very, you know, calculated with all of your shooting and all of that, but you were sending lead down range like I've never seen before. (laughs) (laughs) So explain, you know, just kind of give your experience of shooting some of these guns um, for the first time. 
Yeah. If you had told me that I would have had more fun shooting the tactical shotguns at this test than the bird hunting guns, I would have said no way, like before this test. Like, that's just not what I spend my time doing. But that is what happened. The main difference is it's just a totally different mindset. Like, I leaned into the gun. I was driving the gun. Um, Some of them have pistol grips. And so, yeah, leaning into it and then just, I don't know, having lots of different targets that are stationary, which is also helpful, right? Sometimes I'll get in my head about a moving target, but like, it's very clear. I don't know. I didn't have to think about it. And I think that was probably what was the most fun. Well, I hope you keep some of that energy and spirit (laughs) for the next time we go duck hunting together. Um, Okay, John. What t- tell us about the standout gun from this category? There's a new, really cool, uh, super impressive shotgun here that you need to talk about. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll do the virtual drum roll, but it is the uh, the Beretta 1301 mod two, and this gun has gotten a lot of attention. You know, it's it's fairly new. It's but it's been out it's been out for a minute, and um, it is really just a a superlative example of of the defensive tactical shotgun and probably the most sort of interesting way to look at it is we also had the og like uh just lust object shotgun in here the benelli m4 yeah which has been such a mainstay for so long you know it's a gun i actually i actually had one back in the day i i i I sold it a long time ago but i had one as my home defense gun for a long time and you know, like a lot of people just have very fond feelings toward it, but you compare that M4, which is still a fun gun to shoot and has, you know, those original qualities to the new Beretta. And you can just see how far we've come in this category. Thanks in in part to, you know, what we've learned in the competitive side with multi-gun stuff in terms of like ease of loading and ergonomic, oversized ergonomic controls and things like that. But then also in terms of flexible sighting options with um, red dots and other things. So anyway, you kind of go through that, that Beretta from front to back. Um, Well, we'll just hit on the high points in turn. One, it runs just great. I mean, it is super reliable and it is super fast. I mean, we've had, we've got some good shooters in there. The Renegade um, was a was kind of a, a surprise for me how much I like that gun because as a as a bird gun you know it, it doesn't really it leaves me a little cold just the aesthetics of it and everything else but in this sort of tactical trim that we had um, it it ran really well and has a really nice ergonomic stock and is and is kind of fun to shoot you know so we've got that we've got the um, the Mossberg 940 again just a great value in a gun also fun to shoot and everything else but. Once you get behind the trigger, that Beretta, it's a whole other world. It's like you've, you've, you've graduated to a new kind of level and class of race car. The speed with which that action operates, the quality of the trigger, it's got a really nice, got like a 2.8 pound trigger that is, um, uh, just has a really short re- reset on it. And so between the, the speed and reliability of the action and the quality of that trigger, you can just run this thing noticeably faster than than any of the other guns in the test so just in terms of you know obviously we're, you know you can do mag dumps and that's super fun um but it also tri- <laughs> yes, <laughs> but yes, which it is. you did several <laughs> yeah of which, uh, yes yes there was sort of no 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 uh yeah no no limit put on that but even but it, it also translates to really good control when you're doing tr- uh, transition drills um on on steel so you're kind of working back and forth across an array of of smaller steel targets or whatever and you know once you get you know once you you know twist the throttle on that beretta man you can really just start ripping it goes and then you know you look at the the other just the refinements on it it's got a really comfortable pistol grip it's got a folding stock that one makes it versatile in terms of carrying around and being compact but when it opens up it is you know that that stock is super stiff and it adjusts really nicely for length of pull and for cheek height. And the thing that's kind of cool about it is that, you know, the shotgun also has, it comes with a really good, solid, like bomb proof set of like ghost ring um, rear and, and, you know, front post sight that are protected by really beefy 
wings and stuff. So you've got, it comes with great open sights, but it has a little section of pick rail in front of the, the rear sight on top of the receiver. So you can mount a red dot up there. In addition, um, sort of up, up, above the pistol grip is a little platform that is cut for, uh, you know, uh, the Trijicon pattern red dot that mounts right there. So, you know, just the, the flexibility of the platform, just the mount is sweet. Yeah. I mean, it, um, you know, it's, it's very low profile, which I think is part of the, I think that's part of the speed element too, is when it comes up to your shoulder, it's like right there with some of these guns having to put the, you know, mount the rail on top of the receiver on the receiver and then mount the red dot on top of the rail. It's a little bit higher throwing the gun up and trying to shoot really quickly. You kind of find that you're, you know, adjusting your head a little bit with this Beretta shotgun. That's not the case at all. It's mounted really low. And also you can see the sights too. And at first I thought that was going to be kind of weird, you know, seeing the dot and the sights at the same time. But then when you're uh, trying to shoot fast and you're looking through the, you know, the red dot housing and you're focused on the target, you almost don't really see anything other than just the dot and the target and all that other stuff sort of, you know, kind of goes into soft focus and it's not distracting at all. So yeah, I thought that was really clever. And, you know, I shoot turkey guns a lot and all my turkey guns have red dots on them. So a lot of those, you know, red dot mounts are inelegant compared to what Beretta has done here. Yeah, I mean, it just from front to back, it's just a beautifully executed gun. You know, it loads so smoothly. Yeah. So, you know, getting, you know, restuffing it with shells, it just, you know, you can, you can top it off again in a flash. You can, it's got a bunch of different options for sling carry. The, the foreign is nice and has great tactile grip on it. You know, aggressive grip that you need to help control a gun like this. You know, and this goes back to what Natalie said about driving a gun. You have to drive these guns hard. You know, these are not gentle tools, right? These are, these are brutal, rough platform you know especially with defensive loads in it and you and you have to you know you have to treat them rough you know yeah. you, you can't baby them and and the the bread allows you to do that um you know it's got little m lock cuts up on the forend you know it's just extremely well thought out it really lacks for nothing yeah we should say that it costs almost twenty three hundred dollars so that's a little pricey there are some other guns in this test that are also worth calling out that aren't quite as expensive. And one of those is the Bossberg 940 Thunder Ranch edition. Mm -hmm. Talk about that one a little bit. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, that 940 platform has been just super successful for Mossberg. And they have had a, a lot of different iterations of it. Hunting guns. Um, I've, I've run one of their competition guns before that was like for three gun and multi gun. And that was, you know, Jerry Mikulik, you know, of Smith and Wesson fame has also been a, you know, he and his, his daughter have been, uh, sponsored Mossberg shooters for a while now. And so they've been kind of adding their expertise and, and sort of, uh, shooting philosophy and, and needs to Mossberg's product development. And so we have this. Thunder Ranch version and Thunder Ranch run by the iconic Clint Smith, one of the saltiest um, firearms instructors out there who, um, you know, when interviewed years ago by a urban reporter, this woman asked him about like, you know, d doesn't it make you feel bad to think about like some of your students, you know, shooting people? And Clint just said to her, well, some people need shooting. And that was that. So anyway, so now we've got, you know, channeling the, 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 the vibe of, of, of that is, is this 940 Thunder Ranch version, which, you know, again, it is really full featured shot. Great for us, smooth operating, easy to reload and, and at a good price, you know, it doesn't have the, the same level of refinement and bells and whistles as the as the Beretta, but it costs quite a bit less. About a grand less. About a grand less, you know, and it still has some kind of modularity to it and, and you know, it's got QD cups for, for uh, slings that way as in, in addition to regular kind of hard swivel points and stuff. And, you know, that tang mounted safety on it is kind of one of the best designs. You know, one of the one of the hang ups 
or one failure point or yeah or uh, you know detracting points i guess i should say for some of these defensive guns is the cross bolt safety that's at the rear of the trigger guard some of those work okay you know but some of them will get a little sticky and and you know it's one thing to have that on a hunting gun but you know i think you've experienced yourself you know you start to think about these guns in that defensive role and all of a sudden like a, a catchy you know a, a safety that doesn't work quite right you know, that can be the difference between life and death. Yes. Yeah. I, you know, I was trying, as we were doing some of these drills and stuff and, you know, shooting some of these targets, I was trying to have that mindset of shooting these guns really seriously. You know, like I'm going to mount the gun as quickly as I possibly can and get it on target and shoot as quickly as I possibly can. Not doing it just for fun, but really trying. And there's an obvious difference in speed with some of those cross bolt safeties that if you're used to shooting hunting guns or just you're kind of shooting more casually, you probably would not notice, you know, like you kind of throw your shotgun up on a duck that's coming in the decoys and you fumble a little bit and then he flares, but you still, you know, you still get a shot off and maybe you hit the duck, maybe you don't. And if you, you know, if you mess up, all your buddies kind of laugh about it. That's not what's going on here. That's that's not the spirit of these guns. So issues like those safeties and their design, yeah, it, it's just it's honestly it's just kind of a different way of me thinking about firearm design. Because for a hunting gun, you know, whatever, I'm fine. I'll figure that safety out. But it's different in this category. Yeah, and any anyway, you know, and that Mossberg, you know, has a nice safety on the on the rear of the receiver that has like nice real estate and it's a more refined version of the old kind of tang type safeties that you've seen on Mossberg. So it's a, an improvement there. And, you know, and, and, and I think in general, I mean, a lot of these shotguns sort of have existed in other formats, yeah, sporting formats or whatever. And, you know, but you can see kind of the refinements that have been folded in into them and, you know, with the oversized controls, you know, the receivers that are kind of easier to load you know, the, the appropriate type of adjustability in the stock, you know, particularly where on some of these, you want a shorter length of pull, you know, depending on kind of your shooting style and other things, you know, if you're more squared up, um, as, as is often taught in defensive shooting, you know, particularly with the idea for like military and LE guys who are going to be wearing body armor, you know, you don't want to be bladed yeah. at that point. You actually want your chest kind of forward and square to the target, right? You know, so they're, bunch of reasons and and shooting that way that's that's why a lot of these guns have shorter lengths of pull hmm. or the ability to go shorter yeah versus a, a traditional sporting gun so you know but the, the, and so there's a lot of sameness um to to the category but as we as we saw you know they can kind of have a similar type of feature set oversized control extended uh, magazine maybe some modularity to to add accessories but that doesn't mean they're equal yeah one, uh, you, you said this before, it was kind of a surprise to you, but it actually wasn't a surprise to me. The Savage uh, Renegade Security, you know, both you and Matt were kind of commented about how surprised and, and happy you were at how well that gun kind of shot, especially shot quickly. I had hunted with the, the you know, kind of general Renegade, the general bird gun in Argentina last summer. And, you know, we're shooting like a thousand rounds a day. And you notice really quickly with that shotgun that it's just really light recoiling. It's really easy to shoot. There's some things on the bird gun version of it. I think there's some challenges there with, you know, kind of how it swings and how it handles. But knowing like the shooting protocol that we we're going to be going through and seeing this Renegade security, which is just the kind of shortened down, more compact version. I was like, oh, this gun's going to do really well because it's super light recoiling, really easy to keep on target. It's a little bit heavy, which in some ways is positive, you know, for this, you know, for this kind of work. But kind of talking about what you had had said before, it has some hitches, especially with the safety. Yeah, I mean, it was it was a pleasant surprise, though, you know, and if and if Savage could, you know, address that safety, you know, and and again, we we scored these guns. You know, seriously. So er, the ergonomic score, for example, I mean, that is 
specifically looking at how the the gun inter- interfaces with your hands you know so the 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 tactical the tactile element of how the controls respond to you and absent the safety it would have gotten really good ergonomic score but that safety is such a legit issue on this on our sample anyway where you know it was just stiff and and not automatic to engage when you wanted it to engage you know that we had to ding the gun pretty hard on that it's sort of a you know like you said in a hunting gun eh, you can live with it maybe not as big a deal but this is a different kettle of fish and we grade according to the field as it exists and the field as the expectations for it exist yeah so yeah Yeah. okay let's end it here madeline if you're still awake what was was like your big takeaway what's your headline for the shotgun the shotgun field of 2024 all the shotguns yeah just just everything you know the the you got a pretty broad look at what's available or at least what's new in 2024 and what were what's your overall impression my overall impression is that there is not a ton of new and interesting stuff out there in the hunting and sporting world. And that if I were, cause I am, I'm in the market for like a 12 gauge over under pheasant gun. Like I'm, I've been looking for one and I am not, I'm, I'm not getting it this year from this crop of shotguns. So I will keep an eye out for what else is out there, but also now I am in the market for a tactical shotgun. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, I think we found one for you. <laughs> John, how about you? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, historically, you know, shotguns are, are not as dynamic a field as handguns or, or rifles. You know, the both the, the handguns and rifles, you know, you know, lend themselves to I think more interesting developments, innovations, and and kind of application, you know, and and the shotgun field is generically a little kind of sleepier by nature. But even based on that, this was, you know, uh, you know, I mean, underwhelming might be too strong a word, but it wasn't, you know, it 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 didn't really wow us this year. There's some good guns in there on the on the hunting and sporting side, but nothing. Nothing that really, really sang to us on the defensive side. Much more interesting. The the Breda, a shining star. That Mossberg, um, you know, super, super interesting. Uh, you know, the the Savage Reni- Renegade security has a, has a lot of potential. Um, I think if if that that main issue with the safety could get resolved. So, you know, that's that's a very cool. Um, you know, cool side. I mean, again, it's always, it's always great to put these guns head to head. It's really the only way to test them ultimately, yeah. ultimately, you know, because you test it in a vacuum and you just don't get the context for what else is out there. And, you know, and, and so that's, that's the value to how we do this. It was, you know, super, super cool field, a lot of fun shooting these guns, you know, and, and, and I think that the results in our story are going to accurately reflect, you know, what's out there. Yeah. Well, thank you both for all of the shooting. Oh, wh- what do I have to what, say? Yeah, what's your headline? Uh, or takeaway? I have a couple takeaways. This one's kind of more like insider baseball, but I think we're really tough graders of shotguns. You know, I think a factor of that is we have done this test before. We've shot a lot of shotguns on the market. So we have not, we don't grade these guns just on the, on their, uh, on their year, you know, so we're not grading all the 2024 guns just against all the 2024 guns. We're grading them against our knowledge of what is out there and available. And we're not trying to recommend a gun just to someone just because it's new. You know, we know that, you know, potentially in this category, this specific category of, let's say over under shotgun. There's a better option for you. It's just not the new one. So we're tough. The Outdoor Life team is tough in its evaluations and scoring. But I think we are, we're that way, well, you guys by nature, but also kind of for the higher purpose of the benefit to the reader or in this case, listener. And then two, I think it's a tough market. 
on the hunting side. I think there's a lot of really good guns that exist and have existed for a long time, you know, kind of standards that are nearly perfect. And for any new shotgun to kind of come in and compete with any of those tried and true guns, um, reliability being such a huge issue with shotguns or such a key factor with shotguns, any new gun is kind of suspect, right? Like we shot them a lot, but only over the course of four days. Like a shotgun's got to stand up for a year, many years of hard shooting before it kind of really like earns our trust. So yeah, we're tough graders. It's a tough market. I think there are interesting guns in this field and there's a lot of more interesting guns out there in the shotgun universe. And I think going forward, we're going to change up our testing to test the entire universe of shotguns. So if your shoulders are sore now, which mine is, just wait till next year. (laughs) (laughs) So with that, thank you both. I'm going to have more whiskey and then go to bed because I'm very tired. I'm with you. (laughs) The Outdoor Life podcast is edited by Mike Peterson of 85 Audio. It's hosted by our editor-in-chief, Alex Robinson. And it's produced by me, executive editor Natalie Krebs. To read John's full test on hunting and sporting shotguns, check out outdoorlife.com slash shotguns24. That's outdoorlife.com slash shotguns24. Stay tuned for his coverage on the tactical shotgun field. Music in this episode was composed and performed by Pierre Locatelli via APM Music. <laughs> <laughs>